Welcome from the Valley of the Sun. I'm John Kirkwood, and uh, thanks for joining us. The story of David is um, filled with a number of episodes that are really challenging, you know, as you read them. Of course, everyone, if you were going to pick your favorite story of David, um, that would differ probably by your age. But when you're asked to pick something that bothers you in the life of David, you know, it could be the Bathsheba Uriah event. It, it might even be his, the response to the rape of his daughter and Absalom's uh, response and so forth. There, there are a number of events in David's life that are really troubling. One that not many people think about is one that troubled me as a young man reading his story. Good morning. And it was um, during the reign of Saul, Israel's first king, David uh, went to the enemies. He went to uh, the enemies of Israel and volunteered his services as a mercenary, even uh, willing to fight against his own country. And you think about that and you say, wow, that's, that, that's crazy. And you could see how, because he did that, the seeds of unrest with uh, some people in Israel would, would remain even when he became king. Maybe a distrust or... Uh, suspicion of self-service and so forth. And I really struggled with that, even though Saul was less than an admirable character, a little bit crazy himself. Um, that one was troubling for me. And the, but the more you study life and especially war, you find out that it wasn't unique to David. Um, you read about our own civil war here in this country, a bloody, bloody battle. And you see how families were divided by that conflict, sometimes with sons fighting on opposite sides, family members fighting on opposite sides, best friends, guys who had stood up as a best man in the wedding of their friend ended up opposing each other on that battlefield. And so you see that there are things that sometimes come into play that are larger than, than what we'd expect, you know, in, in a clear cut, um, black and white world. Uh, one of my favorite stories about oh, I, the great conflict of the past century, World War II, and I was talking with my brother yesterday on the phone, my brother Steve, and he told me a story I'd never heard about a woman who was in the OSS in, in World War II and, and her exploits, and it was fascinating. And I thought to myself, there could be, there could be, whole volumes written on just what the women in World War II accomplished for the Allies. But one of the stories um, that very few people know about is maybe the strangest battle of the war. And that was the last battle. I mean, not the last major battle. <laughs> it's virtually unknown. But the last battle of World War II was a battle over a castle. And you could go visit it today. It's the Castle Itter. And what had happened there, and this is what makes it so intriguing, is it's the only battle of World War II where the Germans, the German army, and the American army fought together. Yeah, you heard me right. As a matter of fact, on the Allied side, in the, in the defense of that castle, uh, were American forces, um, Wehrmacht forces. And even at the beginning of the battle, it was led by a convalescing SS officer. Here's what happened. You know, toward the end of the war, the SS had been given orders from high command to kill all the prisoners, right? Uh, to dispose of the evidence, if you will. And at the Castle Itter, which was a compound connected to the Dachau concentration camp. It was a prison camp, turned into a prison camp, 43 by Himmler, for high-ranking VIP prisoners, mostly from France, early in the war. So you head there, a famous, actually, tennis player, and uh, a couple generals, a couple former politicians who had even been uh, a, 
uh, chairmans and premiers in France. And, and you had Charles de Gaulle's sister, handful of these very important prisoners. And just before the allies were in the area, the commandant of that prison camp got uh, cold feet and he, he sent one of the prisoners to reach out to the Americans for help. True story, he sent them with a letter. And this prisoner was a, a Czechoslovakian communist. Yeah, great story, right? So here a communist was sent by a Nazi to seek the help of the Americans, right? He gets there, he gets to the Americans, he alerts them of, of the predicament. The Americans sent out uh, a group to rescue these people. That group was stopped at a bridge and involved in another skirmish and couldn't get there. And so just a handful of Americans went, went forward. And uh, well, eventually it's a long story, but uh, I'm gonna boil it down for you. It's, it's, it's a tremendous story if you wanna read it. But eventually what happens is a handful of Americans with one tank, right? And um, a handful of German <laughs> soldiers end up defending this castle against 200 SS uh, soldiers. Um, the SS soldiers take out the American tank. And at the very last minute, the Americans uh, and the Germans are reinforced, saving the compound. But it's an event where German soldiers actually, for the first time in the war, said, this is too far. No, we're not going to carry out these orders. As a matter of fact, you're, you're not going to kill these people. And if you want to get to them, you're going to have to get by us first. Wow. If there was any lesson of World War II that strikes against Hitler's idea of blood and soil, it is the defense of Castle Itter. And uh, it's a story that the good man tells his son. Because one of the greatest dangers, even in the American church, in the, in the body of Christ as a whole, is not understanding the difference between diversity and division. Um, our reaction to differences in the body is something that we have to overcome to be proficient as the body of Christ, right? The hand can't say to the eye, I have no need of thee. Now I know there are times, right? Where you don't need the hand, right? If we're, I don't know, sitting down watching a show, the hand doesn't need to operate unless it's changing the channel with the remote control or reading a book, now, the hands might hold the book, but the eyes do most of the hard work. If you walk into your bedroom at night and the lights are off, the hand does most of the work reaching for the light switch to turn it on. The eyes are useless. It would be a mistake in that moment to think that the eyes are not important, not vital, not something we should celebrate and be grateful for. But there's a tendency, even in the body of Christ, for us to divide into tribes and to allow what my father used to say, to allow the unimportant to trump the important. And so throughout scripture, we're told over and over to, as my friend John Hora would say, keep our eyes on the prize, right? The finish line, uh, Christ, and not on the runners around us. Don't be distracted. <laughs> um, be like that runner who's looking straight forward and doesn't turn around. This is uh, easier said than done. So I want to talk about that a little bit today and talk about um, the word church uh, some, at some point today and all of next week, probably. We have not left the revolutionary Christ because the revolutionary Christ is actually the answer to all this. But Paul, in his writings, especially uh, you see it developed in, in Romans, his uh, letters to the Roman church, to uh, Colossae, to Galatia. Paul is, is fond of pointing out the obvious. Um, he knows there's a distinction between the Jew and the Greek. After all, 
the Apostle Paul hasn't been called to fill Judas's position. He's not the 13th Apostle. He's called the Apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Uh, he has the challenge of bridging a chasm, a gap between the Jewish world and the Gentile world. He's going to take the gospel message out of Jewish confines where it was birthed and take it to the Greek. And so in Romans, you see this phrase, to the Jew first and to the Greek and also to the Greek. And you see it, I think, as early as, I don't know, chapter one or two. And he repeats it a few times. And finally, you get to, and uh, let me take you there, chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I hope I'm there. I am. Romans chapter 10. This is the tree of length version. Paul says in verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. Whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. That word trust, right? Our confidence, our belief, our faith. These are all synonyms. Whoever has faith in him. That's what faith means, to have trust, to have confidence. It's a connection. It's a connection that um, speaks to integrity. The object of our trust has an earned integrity. And so we sit in the chair or we fly in the airplane or we, we delegate something to somebody under us at work that we're confident will carry it out. Or... Um, when we go out on a date with our wife, we, we trust the protection of our children to somebody that we have confidence in, a babysitter, a family member. Whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. And here it is, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. We finally get to Paul's conclusion. Um, he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek that the gospel comes and, and other things earlier in this epistle. But now, now there's no distinction, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Imagine how that message was received in the Jewish community, hmm? which you're going to see had all the benefits, right? They had the benefits of, of carrying the oracles of God, of being the covenant people, the people of promise. They had all these benefits and these benefits and these privileges and these responsibilities had made this people callous in their arrogance, right? They thought uh, they were, they had all this because they were special, right? They were chosen because they were special, even though in both Testaments, it says, nah, don't get carried away. <laughs> God didn't choose you because you were beautiful. He didn't choose you because you were powerful. He didn't choose you because you were great of number or you had any leverage or you had some uh, legacy he created you out of the dust but he he elects you to prove um an important reality to the rest of the world and so you're going to experience well privilege and responsibility and in that relationship to god there's going to be suffering right dennis prager jokes um that uh if the if the, if the jews read the old testament why would they want to be the chosen people when you, when you see of, uh, all the adversity that would take place with them. But here now, Paul calls out, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek in this new connection, in this new family, in this new relationship um, where God is bringing Jew and Gentile together now. No division in this entity called the body of Christ. And he says, for the same Lord is Lord of all, richly generous to all who call on him, to all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of Adonai shall be saved. Well, that's a beautiful promise, and it covers, encompasses the globe. And in the mind of Paul and in the mind of the first century reader, there was no other division besides Jew and Greek. That's it, that covered everybody. Uh, it wasn't meant to be a specific designation. It's in the Jewish world. There was the Jew and then the barbarians were everyone else, right? The goy. 
um, in our uh, day and age. Um, so this is what he was saying is everybody now, everyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Uh, Tolkien brings this out beautifully in The Lord of the Rings. When some people who knew Gandalf by the name of Gandalf heard him called by another name, when they arrived in the country of Gondor and they, they thought that people got his name wrong and uh, Gandalf corrects them and says, no, I'm known by different names in different places and different lands. Um, and this is the, this, this is the, what's happening here. It's uh, the Jews no longer, right, have um, the right of first refusal here, right? There's no distinction now between Jew and Greek. This would be hard to hear for certain people. It would be a welcome blessing to others. Yes, for the same Lord is Lord of all, richly generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of Adonai shall be saved, everyone. No one will be passed by. There's not a bouncer standing at the door with a guest list <laughs> who's going to turn anyone away. Anyone who comes to the Bema and calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, how does this play out? Now, if you go um, further into the Pauline epistles, let's skip forward to Galatians. Right, I need my glasses again. Paul in Galatians here at the end of what we call chapter 3. Uh, is he's talking here about the distinction between the Jew under the law, and the law being a, a guardian to the Jew. Um, and uh, now he, he, he gives this distinction hmm, where he says, for you are all sons of God through trusting in Messiah. Yeshua, here's that word again, confidence, belief, faith, trusting, placing your trust in Messiah, Yeshua. It's this um, culminates in sonship and adoption and placement into the family of God. For all of you who were immersed in Messiah, baptized into Messiah, that's what that word means, baptismo. All of you who were immersed, placed into, do you like that better? Messiah, have clothed yourselves with Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah, Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed, according to the promise. What, what, what is Paul teaching here? Well, the hearers knew that uh, when they walked out of that room, after hearing that letter, whoever's living room they were in, whatever church setting you want to define it as, they knew when they walked out of that room, they were still uh, male and female, Right. This isn't uh, an erasing of gender like what's happening in, in modern day where you can choose your gender or erase it altogether. And Paul is, is, is not saying that. And, and certainly those who came to that, to that uh, community, to that fellowship in Galatia uh, with an earring in their ear, announcing their, their, their slavery, their ownership by another, when they left that meeting, they were still slaves. And when they left that meeting, they were still, if they were Jews or Greeks, they were still Jews or Greeks. But w w what is Paul saying? He, he's not speaking of a physical relationship. He's speaking of a metaphysical one. The fact that in Christ, oh, I'm still on scripture. So while I'm still on here, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the message Bible as well. I like what, what uh, uh, Peterson does here. He says, in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave or free, male and female. Among us, the body, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. All right, I'll stop the sharing there, and we'll come back to Colossians in just a moment. So what, what is this teaching saying? It's drawing you out of what, um, what makes us divided over what makes us diverse. It's recognizing diversity, but it's calling us to unity. And our unity is not in some 
um, ambiguous fifth essence, quintessence, you know, the Greek understanding of earth and air and water and fire are the four essences of creation, but there's a fifth essence that holds it all together. And for eons, they search for what that fifth essence was. And Paul is saying that the fifth essence is not of the material world. It's God come down in human flesh. It's that human we know as Jesus Christ, that theanthropic man, if you will, that God man who is raised up to the right hand of, fa of the Father. He is the quintessence. And in him, we are all one. In him. Oh, a few years back, Al Gore, and this happens when people speak a lot, so I'm not picking on Al Gore. It's not a political statement. Republicans make uh, awkward uh, statements as well. But a few years back, Al Gore mixed up uh, E Pluribus Unum, out of the many one. He, he said, out of the one many. Um, but uh, the United States, or these United States, was looked at as out of the many one that our unity uh, was diverse. In other words, that we are a nation of states, right? That are sovereign states, but we've come together with this general agreement that all, all 50 have to agree to, that they are going to abide under this main covenant. Um, there's still a few states that have retained in their own constitution uh, an article that uh, would, would free them from that covenant, but there, there's still, this is the meaning of that, out of the many, one. And it has a very uh, Christian, <laughs> actually, uh, foundation out of the many, one, because uh, Paul is saying here now, the family of God, the body of Christ is that melting pot that America promised to be. And the melting pot that America promised to be wasn't to purge you of your Italian heritage when you came here. It wasn't to purge you of your Mexican heritage when you came here or your Indian heritage or your Czechoslovakian heritage or whatever heritage that your forefathers or you yourself, if you're first generation, have brought to this country. It wasn't to purge you of the fact that you eat different right? Um, it was simply to say, we have these guidelines here that we live by, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you understand that, no matter where you come from, no matter you know what you eat or how you sing or what language you speak, if you come and you actually bow at that altar, we welcome you as a brother. So we have that here in America. We have that kind of understanding that's kind of built into our warp and woof. We don't always measure up to it. And sometimes that melting pot, which is a good symbol, right? A stew is something that's really great. A witch's brew, not so much. So oftentimes in American history, we resemble more a boiling cauldron, yeah, than, than a melting pot. Uh, and, and I just turned the melting pot into a stew. Well, that's my stomach speaking. You know what a melting pot was to burn off the dross and refine the metal, right? It's something that's uh, more glorious. And it's not more glorious because the dross is burned off. It's more glorious because the, spe the special things you brought from your own background, if they fit within our system, we celebrate them. And we welcome them and we're grateful for them. Yeah. So anyway, where did I, where did I get off? Oh, Paul and Colossians. Let's look at the Colossians verse and then we'll come back and speak about this in, in, in just a second. So let me share, go back to scripture and we will look at um, Colossians. I believe that's also in the third chapter and here, um, Let's start back in chat in verse nine. Paul says, don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. 
every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious, irreligious, insider, outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free mean nothing here. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment and never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing and cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out, uh, out to God. Let every detail in your lives, in word and action, I'd say indeed, whatever, be done in the name of the master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Wouldn't we live in a different world of Christians Embrace that as their daily prayer. And it won't hurt you, by the way, friend, if you take this as your morning reading. I know um, sometimes if you read the same thing every day, things get tedious, but Paul repeated this often. It needs to be in our mind often. We need to refresh ourselves until it becomes second nature. We find ourselves in adverse circumstances or maybe in, in a difference with somebody and and there's more heat than light, maybe we need to step back for a second. And while we step back and listen to the person, maybe we need to reflect on what's being said here. Because when we get angry and when we get impatient, by the way, you notice that anger and impatience are not a fruit of the spirit. Um, it's not something that we're supposed to be wearing. It's not supposed to be in our wardrobe, right? So when we find ourselves... Um, angry and impatient. Um, that's a warning, right? That's the Christian nervous system saying, wow, okay, you feel the heat rising, right? You feel the temperature going up. You got a fever. Something's wrong. And the something that's wrong is not the person across from you who you would like to blame for your anger, or it's not the nation. Uh, the government, whom you would like to play, uh, b uh, blame for your anger. It's your reaction to things that happen to you. So it's not that person's fault or that congressman's fault or, or, or whatever. It's your reaction to it. And if you're reacting in a way where you're overheating, well, we know when our car overheats, something's wrong. When smoke is coming out from under the hood, uh, when, when we're stalled on the side of the road, we need to take an action that's different from what we've been doing. So we maybe been driving in the red for too long. <laughs> take your foot off the accelerator. Now, this is way easier said than done. I, I, I struggle with this today. And I will tomorrow, right? On this side of heaven, we need supernatural help to do this. And we oftentimes need the help of one another, of um, somebody who loves us saying, wow, um, I think there's smoke coming out of it. <laughs> Don't look now, but I, and you know, that's a practice and an art to be able to do that uh, in a loving way. And sometimes they'll be uh, lashing out towards us if we, if we get in the way of somebody in his anger or somebody in, in his impatience. And that's um, an aspect of love. Yeah. There's a wonderful movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Some people get distracted by the sound score in it, but um, Rudger Hauer, who just passed away recently, and in, in a movie with Michelle Pfeiffer in her first big hit, a movie called Lady Hawk. Um, 
It's a beautiful love story. And um, I highly recommend it. But in a movie called Lady Hawk, there's a, there's a scene. And uh, I hate to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it. But if you haven't seen it, shame on you. Um, there, there's a scene in it. And, and the basic story is it's a fantasy, medieval fantasy about a man who loved a woman. Uh, but uh, an evil bishop uh, puts them under a curse. Uh, curses them for his unrequited love because he loved the woman too and he makes a deal with the devil and puts them under this curse that uh, makes them forever together but for for an eternity apart in other words during the day the man is a man but during the evening he turns into a black wolf as soon as the sun goes down and this beautiful woman during the day is a falcon right a hawk and uh, when the sun goes down, she turns into a woman. So the woman's companion from now on is the, the wolf and, and the man's companion is the hawk. And they are together, but they're kept apart from, by this curse. And so they try and make, make it work and they struggle with it. And at one point, um, a third person becomes part of the team and uh, man, you know him as Matthew Broderick, and he's a runaway prisoner in the movie. But at one point, there is uh, a moment during the evening after the sun has set where the wolf in their company falls through the ice. And they desperately this, this woman and this boy really try and rescue the wolf who is um, going to freeze and drown in this uh, frigid lake where he has fallen through the ice and they, they, they stab a sword into the ice and they tie a rope to it and the boy, the boy goes in after the wolf and is able to get his hands around the wolf and get the wolf to the edge, able to push the wolf up. But in the doing so, the wolf scratches this boy. And his chest is ripped open. Well, the next day, the man doesn't know what happened. And he rebukes the boy for losing his sword. The sword that was used to save his life. And the stern rebuke. And then the boy answers back what happened. And as Paul's integration as he is, Shakespeare writes in Henry V, he bears his breast to show the wounds that he had in behalf of saving him. Well, that's what love does. Sometimes love is vulnerable to the point where in loving somebody, we love them so much, we expose ourselves and they hurt us and they scratch us, and that's part of the equation. As um, Lewis wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. We open ourselves up to these wounds when we love somebody. And um, some people do it by nature. Some of us, we have to be inspired by stories like this, by people like Jesus Christ, people like, uh, oh, Father Damien, uh, Teresa of Calcutta by, by others who are willing to take pain upon themselves, suffering upon themselves because of their devotion to the well-being of others and to the glory of God. So this, this, is, this happens. It will happen among ourselves if we try and live this out. Unity with diversity comes with a cost. Now, division's fine. Paul never says stop being a woman. <laughs> Um, this, this is again, priority. This is like understanding that if you are to follow Christ, you must hate self or hate mother and father, right? It's, a, it's not saying hate mom and dad. It's saying this is, this is a priority. It's a, it's a hierarchy of concern, right? And actually the deeper meaning that we're left with is if you love Christ in the way you're supposed to. And, and there's, there's wrong ways. It's not actual love. There's infatuation with Christ. It's not actual love. It's the acquiring of trivial information to lord it over others. It's all kinds of things. We, we mold Christ into our own 
shape, oftentimes um, our own ventriloquist tummy. I'm not talking about that. If you truly love Christ, if you truly love God, if you love the Father, Christ said you'll love him. Right? He, you can't divorce the two. And if you love him, you'll be enamored with the word of God. Right? You'll want to know what he said to you. And this will play out, John says, this plays out by your love of the brethren. And so if you truly love Christ, if you truly honor the Father, um, you'll love the brethren as unlovable as they are, as obnoxious sometimes as we all are, as difficult as we are, as different as we are, as bullheaded as we are, as, as uh, obstinate, as ugly. Yeah. This is something that bridges a gap. It's bigger than family. It's bigger than blood and soil. This is something that will last an eternity when families die out, when nations are turned over in a grave, when rust and um, <laughs> worms have eaten everything. This is lasting. And so what's helpful for us now is to realize what's lasting and what holds us together. And what holds us together, wait for it, this might sting a little, as it stung the Jew to hear that there's no difference between Jew and Greek. As it stung maybe the free man who was proud of his ownership of 20 slaves to hear that there's no, in, in Christ, there's no slave or free. This might sting a little. So um, what are the divisions that you're putting in Christ? You see, because we're not held together by Christianity. That's not what it says. We're not held together by the Bible. Does that hurt? People have ele elevated the Bible to the fourth member of the Godhead. It never says that. We can learn a lot about God and appreciate that by our relationship to the Bible, but the Bible doesn't hold us together. As a matter of fact, in, in some places, the Bible is an instrument of division, not because the, the Bible is a negative thing, but because we make a negative thing of it. We, we elevate our personal interpretation of the Bible above what is being said here. And we allow it to divide us. In some cases, something as ridiculous as a Bible version. There will be people listening to this right now, wherever you are around the country who are listening to this, who turned it off because I didn't read from the King James. True. There will be people who, who break fellowship over you not using a particular version. There will be people who... Uh, it, it, it destroys family relationships. It destroys churches over something ridiculous like that. Or secondary, and that's not even secondary. Um, interpretations. There, there are divisions over interpretations, and people have died over them. Servetus, the, the Catholic purge of those who didn't uh, bow to the church's understanding of the text. Some people are thrown out of a church because of their division over it. So it's not Christianity that holds us together. And it's not the Bible that holds us together. Christ is the sustainer. The word of God is not bound by parchment and ink. For our interpretation of parchment and ink. This is hard for some to swallow sometimes. You know who saw it? I have to go there for a second. You know who saw it? And we, we all love her book. And maybe some of you <laughs> didn't realize what she was saying at the time. But Harper Lee saw it. And I, I'm going to try and share it with you in a second here. But Harper Lee, in her classic work, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, saw it. Can I share it with you on screen? And this is Atticus, of course, talking to Scout. And he says, sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of another. 
there are just some kind of men who, who are so busy worrying about the next world. They've never learned to live in this one. And you can look down the street and see the results. If you know the book, you know what he's talking about, about down the street. It was racism, uh, but Bible thumpers, <laughs> Bible waggers, people who would go to church on Sunday, but they were racist. We began by talking about a battle in World War II where good Lutherans would go to church on Sunday wearing their swastikas. Um, so we have this, it's not the Lutheran church or it's not the church or it's not Christianity that holds us together. As a matter of fact, often those things are instruments of division. And it's important that you hear this because God never erases diversity. He welcomes it on conditions. He welcomes diversity with conditions. And he welcomes it in the sense that he wants to bring out unity within diversity, which gives us our word university. That's where we get it, right? That we're going to have a diverse diversity come together, but a common unity when we find the wisdom by weighing these things, by putting them through the fire, by seeing what sticks, that kind of thing. And we do that, by the way, by the word of God, right? And the person and example of Jesus, Paul says that Christ, right, is the image of the Godhead bodily. Um, if you want to know what God is, don't go to your Bible. People have done that for thousands of years, and there's a trail of blood and tears by people who have gone to their Bible to defend their tyranny and their treachery against their fellow men. If you want to know what God is like, go to Jesus Christ. Christ defines that. And people even try and manipulate Christ as a tool of their own understanding. Uh, Tea Party Jesus is always the one overturning the tables. So he's only summoned when the Tea Party wants to make a remark about uh, some kind of small government or anti-government remark or low taxes or uh, whatever it is. And, and I'm, I'm picking on the Tea Party because you'd say I'm part of it, but uh, or I was a part of it, even though I don't like labels. But I, I, I pick on my own first, so, so you understand. that The social justice people choose Jesus too. Um, Jesse Jackson chooses Jesus to promote socialism. Uh, uh, Cornell West um, uh, summons Jesus for Marxism. I, 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 you get all kinds of these things where Jesus is misused. So I'm not saying that Jesus is a problem, and I'm not saying that the Bible is a problem. If you heard that, you're wrong and you need to listen more carefully. But I am saying what the Bible tells us, what scriptures tell us, that it is Jesus that defines God. And so we look and see what Jesus says and what he does that is a definition of God. And the person of Jesus in whole is, is uh, larger than the box that we like to put him in, much larger. He is the man who overturned the tables right? Of the money changers. He, he did that. And that's in there. He's also the man who said, sell your cloak and buy a sword. He's also the same person who said, Peter, put your sword in its sheet. You're using it improperly. That's not the priority. So he, he was um, a complex figure. But the people who want to use the Bible as an instrument of their own defense will, uh, when you see, I, I've seen Tea Party people go back to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and pretend that they're a prophet called out of the Old Testament and they're a watchman on the wall somehow. And they, they use, utilize that language. And it's just how, I, I, I hate to be cruel, but it's like what the Nazi party did with the Bible. They rewrote the Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, rewrote the New, and there was a Nazi-approved version. And all of us in our worst moments have done that. Cherry-picked verses to defend some kind of lesser argument. That doesn't mean anything. Um, so what does this all mean? Right? When Paul is, is showing us in Colossians and Galatians that in Christ now we are one, even though we are diverse. And he mentioned, makes this argument, even though he doesn't use that exact phrase all the time. He'll, he'll make the argument 
elsewhere where he'll say we have differing gifts or we have differing offices, but we're all one in Christ, right? There are differences, but there is a unity. I want to bring this up because in, in, the, in the West, we're seeing the failing of the church. I know there's articles saying we're thriving. A pastor shared with me an article the other day uh, written by a man who lies with statistics, you know, because there's a tendency in the church to cover up any bad news. And so the, the opening passage of this guy's article was the church is not dying in the United States. It's thriving. It's growing in raw numbers. So that was the statement. And I, I underlined it and sent it back to the pastor in raw numbers. It's growing. If this guy who wrote this um, column worked for McDonald's, he'd be fired within 10 minutes of the first quarterly meeting because McDonald's is always growing in numbers. But if they were growing in numbers and they lost a 30% market share and you came into the room and said, good news, everybody, you'd be either laughed out of the room or tossed out of the third floor. And so to, to not recognize what's been happening here is not to see what's happened in Europe, right? Europe is a post-Christian um, continent and no one denies that. <laughs> no one denies that when you have less than 2% of people attending assembly on, on a given Sunday in England, which is the most religious uh, place in Europe, that uh, it pales in comparison to our, our 30%, which is shrinking. Um, now, that, that doesn't tell you who's in the body of Christ and who's not. It just, it's kind of like, uh, you know, taking somebody's temperature and seeing where they are. And um, we are trending in the direction of the post-Christian Europe. And to pretend that nothing's wrong when you have young people and women fleeing the church, like in droves, we're losing young people and women fleeing the church in droves. There's a reason for it. There's a number of reasons for it. Maybe we'll talk about it next week. But when you pretend that's not happening, it's like those who danced in the ice shavings on the promenade deck when the Titanic hit the iceberg, right? Who were drinking it up and laughing and making snowballs on the promenade deck. Oh, look, how cool is this? That's how foolish it is because you're laughing about your children and your grandchildren who are not just leaving the church. And here's one thing I want to say to you. I see article and article and article that want to treat this symptom, that, that want to react to this, the, these casualties, right, of what's happening. And all the articles center around the church. How do we get these people back in church? How do we get people into church? Wow. Is something missing there? <laughs> Did I, even the Great Commission doesn't say go into all the world and make churches? Um, our definition of church has changed over time. And church used to mean people. Now it means buildings, brick and mortar, or it means a group of people one hour, one day a week on Sunday. It never means that never means that in scripture. Even when scripture talks about local fellowships, it talks about them citywide. <laughs> it defines them not by their denomination. When Paul writes a letter to the churches in Galatia, uh, to the church in Galatia, he doesn't see different churches. When Jesus writes to churches, he writes to a uh, an area of geography, not an area of denomination, right? He doesn't divide... <laughs> The Holy Spirit never allows division upon pettiness, never accepts that. Um, and you see that in Paul seeing the cracks, the fissures happening in Philippi, and he keeps saying, you all, you all, you all. So God writes to geographical locations, and he's writing to believers that are in Corinth, believers that, uh, when Jesus writes, believers that are in Laodicea, right? So it's a local fellowship, but he's, it's... <laughs> It might be meeting in 13 different living rooms. So we, we've lost that idea. You know who hasn't lost it is we, we see it in the persecuted church around the world. We see it when we speak of the church in China. We're not talking about a particular church. We're talking about the New Testament understanding of it, the outcall, the ecclesia. 
those gathered in the name of Christ. Not all of them might be Christians, but they're gathered in the name of Christ. I think a high percentage of them would be because if they're caught, they get in trouble. So you're not going to risk something you don't truly believe in. But right now, the fastest growing church, and this is going to shock you, the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. And it's made up of mostly women. And the women run the church. Women who would be told here, you know, if I, I heard a pastor's wife commenting on this at Dallas Theological Seminary the other day at a table podcast. And she said, you know, um, she's talking about a friend of hers who has a PhD, ran a Fortune 500 company, has her own ministries. And she, she said, she was a pastor's wife. And she said, um, this woman got to a church and basically the church said, we're happy to have your husband here and we'd love it if you held babies. That's the role of the, wo the woman in that church. That's their understanding and abuse of, of scripture. That the woman really should be um, not use any of her gifts. She can't have any gifts unless she's in the mission field. Then we'll cut you some slack there. But in this building, in this brick and mortar building, one hour a week on Sunday, no. Nah, Zip it, zip it, woman. Keep it to yourself. Well, th that's a modern construct. That's something that you don't find in Scripture, and it's an abuse of Pauline doctrine. Maybe we'll get into that another day. But don't don't even bring that verse up to me if your wife or your mother or your daughter doesn't have her head covered in church when she prays, because you're abusing that passage. But anyway, here here we have a church, a fastest growing church. In, in, in the world right now is in Iran. And it's made up of women. Can I share something with you? This is, um, this is from an article talking about it, but that more Iranians have come to faith in Jesus in the last 20 years than the 1300 years since Islam swept through Persia combined. There's a pastor there, Pastor Thomas, and he's calling this movement, the Iranian awakening. He said, so what if I told you the best evangelist for Jesus was the Ayatollah Khomeini? The Ayatollahs brought the true face of Islam to light and people discovered it was a lie. And after 40 years under Islamic law, a utopia, according to them, they've had the worst devastation in the 5,000 year history of Iran slash Persia. So Thomas calls this movement the Iranian awakening and he says this, it owns no property no buildings, no central leadership, and is predominantly led by women. They call themselves after the verse in Matthew 10, 16, where Jesus says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, right? Muslim background Iranians are leading a quiet but mass exodus out of Islam and bowing their knees to the Jewish Messiah with kindled affection toward the Jewish people. But they face great risks. This is uh, what one of them says. We know that if they get us, the first thing they will do to us as women is rape us. And then they will beat us and ultimately they will kill us, one believer said. This is the decision we have made that we want to offer our bodies as sacrifices because I have this thought when I wake up that when I leave that door, I might not come back. So um, Pastor Thomas ends, ends this interview with this. He says, disciples, disciples forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't. The leader said, um, disciples aren't engaged in the culture war. Converts are. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over anything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. So um, this, this is an example of what true church is. This is true church, right? And it includes us all, male and female, right? Slave and free. Uh, Jew and Iranian, Persian uh, and American. And I think in our mindset, we have, to, um, we have to understand what the body of Christ truly is and what truly holds it together. Um, 
unfortunately, and I'll leave you with this, unfortunately, I think many times and in many occasions, what holds us together is um, our uniform. And that's sad. You know, maybe we're wearing the uniform of the, of the Protestants or the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the King James only people. And we have a particular tribe and a particular Jersey and a particular cheer that we're, we're, we're acclimated to. And um, the hand says to the eye, I don't need you. If there was something in the natural world, call it honor, call it nobility, call it integrity, that had an SS officer say, no, I'm going to forsake all my vows. I'm going to forsake my own well-being. And I'm going to defend these French prisoners of war against 200 of guys I used to march with. I'm going to do it regardless of the uniform I wear. If, right, a whole squad of Wehrmacht soldiers could forsake their own country and their own countrymen because they were given an order that was horrific. So much so they'd take arms against those who would see that order through. If we can't learn, right, from something as noble as that, that there are times, as my good friend Brittany Powers wrote, sometimes we'll be called to oppose the best of our friends. And sometimes we'll be called to stand with the worst of our enemies. But if we refuse to do so when the truth requires it, we are not truth seekers. No matter how we posture ourselves. So here's what I want you to do today between now and next week. And next week, uh, Wendy and I, are, well, we have a, some announcements for you. We want to talk to you about uh, our current ministry as it's going forward out here and some other things about church and about the revolutionary Christ who holds it together and who should be that quintessence in all of our thinking and all of our decision-making. But let me, let me just um, leave you with this understanding that um, over the next week, I want you to uh, put yourself through the fire, um, jump into the melting pot, ask the Holy Spirit to purge from you all the dross, all the chaff from whatever you brought in to the body of Christ that God would not have, or that is dividing you from your fellow believers. Remember, and, and this is a phrase I'm off, uh, awfully um, repeating. Scripture does call us, and the God of the Bible calls us to um, hate the ism and love the ist. People always say, hate the sin and love the sinner. Well, sometimes uh, Christianism is the sin whether it's found in, in whatever particular ism that we've carried the flag for. Calvinism, Arminianism, uh, dispensationalism, uh, anything we could make an idol over what God has asked us to do. Anything that divides us up into small little esoteric isolated groups that think they have it all and everyone outside them isn't really saved. All these isms, um, are abhorrent to God, but the, the ist isn't. The Calvinist is a brother. We're called to love that brother. The hardest part of Luke 15 for me is loving the elder brother. It's not loving the younger brother. It's loving the elder brother. And the fact that there was room at God's table for both sons, even though one of them wouldn't come in. And we need to understand that. We're called to love our brother even when he's obnoxious and whatever end of the continuum he's on, because we're on that continuum too. Whether it's the lascivious end and the bar stool and the pigsty, or it's the self-righteous end <laughs> with the sun in the field thinking he's doing the Lord's work. Whether it's the beaten guy on the Jericho road or the priest and the Levite that walked by him. Our question should be, how does the love of God in my life bring healing to both the oppressor and the oppressed? because God loves them both.
and there's healing for both and there's a better life for both. And part of God's remedy for that is you and I and the Holy Spirit working through you and I and the living word of God, not waved by us in our hand, but lived on in, in our heart. God has always been sub, uh, symbolism over uh, substance over symbolism, right? Substance over symbolism. He says, yeah, yeah, you know, I wanted a circumcised heart. You're bragging about the wrong circumcision, the wrong operation. Um, the word of God should be written on your heart, not uh, spit off your tongue like it's venom or waved around in your hand, you know, like you're, like you're vanquishing a vampire with a crucifix. All right, I'll leave you with that. But over this next week, this is what I'd like you to do. This is what I want to do is ask the Lord to purge whatever is within your system of thought that is dividing you from your brothers and sisters. Because there is no Catholic and Protestant in the family of God. But there are Catholics and Protestants. <laughs> do you understand that? Um, there, there's no Baptist and Presbyterian. There's no Calvinist and Arminian. These are all... Um, vestiges of that which should be burned off in the draws with the draws all right i love you all thank you for listening i appreciate your attention i do like hearing from you uh, especially those who are listening around uh, the, the country and at least uh, one person in mexico who's contacted me that's listening down there i enjoy hearing from you if you want to comment uh below um, please comment below. Let me know where you're listening from. And uh, if there's something you'd like me to hear uh, commenting on, I'll have more to say next week. God be with you all.